Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this INR web ISL webinar. Uh, we are launching Roxandra Trandafoya's book, The Politics of Migration and Diaspora in Eastern Europe, Media, Public Discourse and Policy. So my name is Professor Joe Crotty, and I am the director of ISR, the Institute for Social Responsibility that's sponsoring this webinar this afternoon. And Roxandra has asked me to introduce and support this book launch because she was a fellow with ISR for just over a year um, in 2020, 2021. And during that period of time, she undertook a number of activities, which also included writing this book. And I'm very pleased that it's finally out and that we're officially launching it today. The book itself, I think, talks about the importance and highlights the importance of continuing to research Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe and research in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, I know from my own experience as a scholar of the latter, ebbs and flows in terms of research popularity and importance. And sometimes you have something that happens like the war in Ukraine and all of a sudden you become that expert, that person to go to. And then you can go for a long time when nobody is really interested in this area, at least in the, in the popular discourse. And as a result, it's really important that we have scholars that continue to look at the evolving nature of what we used to call the former Eastern Bloc. It may be 30 plus years since the end of the Cold War, but the transition and the transformation of those countries has taken a number of different paths and the way that they intersect with what was Western Europe and the West of the world is still really important. And this book really starts to highlight parts of that story. So in terms of launching the book today, we have three speakers. Of course, we have our author, Roxandra Trantafoyu. She is a reader, reader or associate professor in media and communications at Edge Hill University. And as I've said, she was a former research fellow at the Institute of Social Responsibility and looks at the role of social media and political engagement and activism in Eastern Europe. And not only does she have this book coming out, but she has another looking at the politics of migration and diaspora, focusing on border crossings and mobilities on screen. And that will also be published by Routledge this year. Our other speakers are Florian Bieber. He is Professor of Southeastern European History and Politics and Director of the Centre for Southeast European Studies at the University of Graz in Austria. His recent publications include Debating Nationalism, published by Bloomsbury in 2020, and The Rise of Authoritarianism in the Western, Bal in the Western Balkans, published by Palgrave in 2020. Now, our final speaker is Cathy Burrell, Professor of Migration Geographies at the University of Liverpool, with interest in migration governance, mobility, material culture and home, and is a specialist in Polish migration in particular. Her recent publications include work on Polish mobilization in Sweden, published in Political Geography, and COVID-19 stay-at-home story projects reported on Liverpool experiences. And this is published by the Queen Mary University in London. So the format of today, Roxandra is going to introduce the book, and then Florian and Cathy will discuss their own impressions of the book. And if you have any questions while they are speaking, please put them in the chat and I will pose them on your behalf at the end. We have an hour and 15 minutes set aside for today, so I hope that you'll be able to join us for the whole thing. But if you have to leave us early, we are recording it so you can catch up on what you've missed. So I'm now going to hand over to Roxandra to introduce her book. Over to you. Um, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Joe and um, ICR for hosting. Um, and of course, thank you to Cathy and Florian uh, for being uh, our guests today. Um, I would also like to say that this is the first event of the um, newly established Culture, Power and Inclusion um, Research Group here at Achille University. Um, so thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, you're probably wondering, uh, did we really need another book, especially another book on Eastern Europe? And if we did, why this book? Um, so let me explain why um, I decided to write it. As it often happens, this book started with another book. About two years before proposing my own book to Routledge, I came across a book on migration policy in Europe. It contained chapters on Britain, France, Germany, Italy, 
the Netherlands, Sweden, Greece, and Turkey. Eastern Europe also featured, but only got one chapter. How was that even possible? I had to ask myself. Sure, immigration is a key public discourse in the West with wide social, cultural, political, and legal ramifications. There's always a lot to say about Italy and migration, for example. But Eastern Europe is also being reshaped by migration, often in more complex ways that diverge from state to state. Eastern Europe has seen radically different emigration patterns. A third of Romania's population now lives abroad, but only uh, a very small number of Estonians have chosen to emigrate. Distinctive policies frame keen minority rights and cross-border mobility provision. Here, countries like Hungary, Poland, and Croatia lead. Rights for diasporas have different degrees of focus, from Slovenia to Moldova. Some countries like Albania have clear policies for supporting the return of their migrants. Others do nothing to encourage it. While the so-called refugee crisis of 2015 mobilized populists in similar ways, the public and media response in Eastern Europe has not been a blanket one. I felt that important nuances were being missed by allocating Eastern Europe just one chapter in a book about migration policy. My own book, therefore, emerged as an attempt to refocus the attention on Eastern Europe and the way migration practices and discourses are being negotiated in both informal and formal settings. I wanted to provide a deeper understanding of how media and public discourses impact policies of migration, especially in the current context of widespread digitalization, the colonization of media by political and commercial interests, or rather the continued colonization, complex migration patterns that reshape the notion of citizenship, and the emergence of keen minorities and diasporas as political actors with substantial claims to the policy agenda. I tried to show how certain migration-related imaginaries emerge and are shaped by competing projects and ideas in public discourse, but much more remains to be done. In many ways, I feel that the book was the victim of my own ambitions. I tried to include several key aspects of migration in connection to quite a few countries in Eastern Europe. Even so, so many issues and even more countries have not received the attention they deserve. So where do I think we need to put the work in? The completed book manuscript went to the publisher in autumn 2021, when Russia's intentions vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine were not at all clear. The immediate massive displacement of populations caused by the war has been more apparent than the long-term impact of the war on neighboring countries. Uncertain is also the fate of Ukrainian refugees in the West. Research is already emerging, but what we see is just the tip of the iceberg. Further afield, current and future events in the Eurasian region, uh, the Caucasus need to draw the urgent interest of migration researchers. And of course, we need more, not less research on Russia itself. One of the major weaknesses I identified in migration research is its inability to explain the psychology of emigration, which has a staggering complexity. Economic factors, which I usually talked about when it comes to emigration, particularly the mass phenomenon that represented the East-West um, emigration um, in the European Union, don't always tell the whole story. How collective imaginaries of emigration emerge supported by both formal and informal communications remains, I believe, a worthy topic. One of the things that struck me while doing my research for the book is how often policies are merely reactive or littered for forward planning. In so many cases, governments are only starting to react to the problems stored long term by mass emigration that happened more than a decade earlier in many Eastern European countries. Provision for return, for example, though advocated loudly in public discourse by many politicians, is incredibly patchy, so return is occasionally rendered unsafe. And from emigration now to immigration. Yes, Eastern Europe um, begins to be defined by this phenomenon new to Eastern Europe as well. 
Many countries in Eastern Europe are going through a key shift at the moment at the level of collective psychology that is yet to be fully acknowledged by either scholarship or public discourse. From countries of emigration, they are becoming countries of immigration. While the refugee crisis of 2015 received plenty of attention, labor immigration, which is currently offsetting the population and skill gaps in Eastern Europe, seems less of a concern to academics. Yet beyond populist reactions, how this new labor immigration, mainly from Asia, is going to play out in relation to widespread nationalism in Eastern Europe, the rights of historic ethnic minorities and even returned migrants is yet unknown. Statehood and nationhood are also being reshaped by Eastern European migration. Media and public discourse have an essential role here too. Eastern Europe is now a massive testing lab where borders, real and imagined, play a key role in how nations are de-territorialized and re-territorialized. These processes have implications beyond Eastern Europe. Additional work is also necessary in relation to diaspora's role in forging the transborder nation with an important role, not just for nationalism theory, but also for diplomacy, political communication and legal rights. Like immigration, um, the presence of diasporas um, extending the nation across borders, um, I think it, it's a new experience for countries, for many countries in Eastern Europe and remains how, to be seen how they will deal with this new phenomenon. Eastern Europe has not yet fully investigated processes of decolonization to rival what we see in scholarship related to the global south. There is some excellent work around already, and I try to quote, quote from it whenever possible in my book, but more is needed to understand the complex link between migration and decolonization in Eastern Europe. In the context of the war in Ukraine and Russia's massive disinformation program in, throughout Eastern Europe, decolonization has gained urgency. I think that it, what is also apparent from the book is that Roma mobility is pinpoint to several issues yet unresolved, such as who takes responsibility for the largest ethnic minority in Europe, the unresolved tensions of multi-level governance, and the tolerated infringement of human rights even at EU level. Collective moral responsibility is lacking, and the case of the Roma makes that obvious. Continuing with the theme of ethics. The way different states dealt with labor migration, refugees and border crossings during the pandemic revealed once more the moral dimension of migration. East-West labor mobility proved the survival of hierarchies and treatments that are incompatible in my view with legality, but more importantly with ethics. Western states broke their own laws to allow Eastern workers in the care and meat processing industries, as well as in agriculture, to satisfy the needs of wealthy consumers. And many Eastern European governments just went with it, allowing um, hundreds of flights to take place uh, at the height of the pandemic to satisfy this Western demand. So I think all of these areas that I touch upon in my book deserve further investigation, further research, further consideration. But finally, I would like to say something about several difficulties I confronted during the research process for uh, my book. Among these, I suppose, like in any type of research, issues of terminology. Migration and mobility might have a lot in common, but they carry different cultural, political, and legal connotations. I try to be careful about how I employed certain words and concepts, but slippages were inevitable. Throughout the book, I tried to use research emerging from Eastern Europe itself, but often found myself sliding into using concepts and theories shaped in the West. While this may speak about my own limitations, I still think that bringing the margins to the center is not always an easy task, but we must keep at it if we take processes of uh, decolonization seriously. And finally, I still do not have an answer about how you would reliably prove the link between public discourse, media representation and policy, especially as everywhere you look, your data is suffused with, with bias. Um, 
with ideological discourse. I wrestled with these issues while writing the book and the answers I can come up with do not satisfy me. Um, maybe it's time for another book. Um, but first, um, I'd like to invite our other um, two speakers to add their own views on some of the themes um, I touched upon so far. Thank you. So um, I think as I'm, I'm going first, um, I hope you can hear me well. Um, I'm looking, yeah, I, I enjoyed the book very much. I thought it was was very, very useful. I mean, partly exactly because it offers this wide regional scope um, rather than a national scope or a scope of just one diaspora community. Um, or there's other very good recent research by Maria Koineva, for example, which looks more at, you know, particular areas where migrants have moved to in Europe. But I think this, this perspective, more comparative and regional, is very useful. And I think what it brings out are a few themes I want to kind of mention, which I think, um, you know, past literature hasn't, partly because the reality has developed, um, as, as we've also heard. I mean, one is that the Eastern Europe, if we use that term, has found itself in this place of being both an emigrant and an immigrant societies, uh, which characterize it. So they both have uh, large diasporas or communities uh, in other parts of Europe, but also are host to new migrants, and they're doing both. And I think this interesting transition, and I think a question which emerges from that is, is that pattern going to be the you know, so we're following the experience of Southern Europe, which has gone through a very similar process, you know, basically three decades ago, uh, countries like Spain, Italy, or Greece, which um, have uh, welcomed refugees and migrants in the 90s, uh, when they were previously societies experiencing more uh, emigration to Northern Europe or to North America for that ca uh, case. Um, so this is an interesting moment of transition. Um, and this affects not just the countries which have joined the European Union, like uh, Poland, the Czech Republic, or Hungary, uh, even you know, to a limited degree. But if you go to uh, countries of Southeastern Europe, the Western Balkans, as they're called, uh, which I'm familiar with, you encounter migrants there as well. In Serbia, uh, in the service sector, there are substantial numbers of migrants from uh, from Asia, from uh, from Latin America as well, filling jobs which Serbs have left uh, to work in Western Europe. So th these are, of course, very interlinked processes, as as also the book highlights. And uh, I think the book identifies that there's both the discourse about immigration and the perceived fear about it, um, and the reality, which is, of course, much more complex and much more often uh, with many of these, the larger number of migrants are not refugees, which are often um, seen as a threat, um, uh, as, as, uh, but more labor migrants, which fill jobs, which are left uh, and dealt with by, by society uh, at large. So these are interesting questions which are raised. They also, I think some of the questions which come up is in the book is the relationship between minorities and migration, uh, which I appreciate very much. And a couple of interesting points which emerge from that. I mean, one is when does a migrant become a minority? I mean, that's a question which we're having a lot in West European debates. Uh, you know, how long do you have to be, um, or how long does a community have to be settled in a territory to become a, a minority? And I think that is becoming or is already an important issue with regard to some communities in Central Europe. I mean, the Vietnamese in uh, Czech, the Czech Republic have been recognized as a minority, and there are efforts in that direction in Slovakia. And so um, we're having new minorities as a result, very much beyond the conventional framework of minorities which are constituted as being um, related to a kin state in the close proximity. Um, there's also another dimension, and I think this is where the book highlights this, is that we have these multiple layers of communities. We have you know, con traditional migrant communities of people from uh, Central and Eastern Europe who've migrated to Western Europe, be they as political refugees or be they labor migrants uh, in the case of Yugoslavia. Um, then we have the um, then we have the then we have the minorities which are transnational. I mean, Hungarians are just are just one of the communities mentioned in the book. Um, and then we have the new, more transnational migrants which we see with EU membership. And I think it's important to highlight how they are different in many ways from earlier migration waves. First of all, um, 
with you know both Ryanair, uh, Wizz Air, and uh, Skype, uh, maintaining contact with the home country is much easier than it ever was, and many actually have um, inhabit multiple spaces. They don't, as also the book identifies, don't only live in the new place of residence, but they also maintain very active ties with the country of origin. And this creates a kind of transnational migrant who, who, who is not just uh, leaving and going somewhere. So this kind of classical image of a migrant who leaves one place and goes to another one has to be in a certain way questioned. But these are people who often have a life between places, um, uh, as also then becomes sometimes, as the book identifies, pathologized when it comes to um, uh, we, we have the case mentioned of, of Romanian children who, who are neglected by parents who are part of the time abroad. But, you know, many families and, and, and societies manage this multiple um, places of residence. And I think this raises interesting questions about belonging, about, about you know, how, how um, monocytal does a, does a life have to be? And we imagine it in particular ways, which might, we might have to revise um, as the experience shows. Um, so, so these are, I think, some of the, the the kind of interesting question which the book raises, and I think in a certain way it opens more doors for further uh, case studies and more in-depth research. Uh, the, the, the real contribution, I, I think, is the comparative scope and opening these these questions. Um, as Oksandra has also mentioned, in a certain way, uh, you mentioned in your introduction how, how it in a certain way pushes forward certain new research topics. Um, the other topic, which of course it discusses a lot, um, is how public discourses are about migration. And, um, and I think one of the themes which, which comes across is of course the anxiety of, of extinction, which is very strong in Central and Eastern Europe, which is manifest in a number of uh, dimensions. So it's this uh, the, the fear of national extinction, um, which we find manifested in three levels. Two are in the book, which is migration, um, and one is a bit extra, but um, one is the emigration, so that emigration is lost, right? And there was a headline in a Croatian newspaper a few years ago, which says, we have lost more people this year going abroad than we lost uh, during the homeland war, the war of the 1990s. Um, and so what is interesting in that is it, it equates death in a war with the emigration of people which of course is a very strange idea because it's from a very state-centric perspective. You know, in both cases, those people are gone, but in one, they're living happy, happy or you know, not happy, but they're living lives um, employed um, in Germany, Austria, Sweden, or elsewhere. Um, and in the other one, they are dead. I mean, this is you know, fundamental different from an individual experience, but in the rhetoric of the perception, there's the sense that emigration means loss for the, for the state and for the nation, of course, uh, very importantly. And on the other side, immigration is equally a threat to the nation because these are communities which are fundamentally Un, um, uh, you know, uh, alien, and of course, um, not just alien, but in the national concept, which does not foresee uh, assimilation or integration or incorporating communities which are not based on descent, um, even that is more difficult, where at least in other countries, um, idea of integration of migrant communities um, over time is more uh, more uh, possible. And I mean, it, it will be an interesting question to see whether the self-conception of nations or nationalisms will change in many of the countries uh, down the road, whether it will become possible to join the nation. Um, and, you know, we, we do have examples. I mean, not least in Czech Republic, one of the leaders of the far right is himself of half Japanese descent. So in a certain way, one can be uh, a, a Czech nationalist and of of a migrant descent, but of course, the fact that it's Japanese might make it an exception because it is, after all, rather unusual migrant background for the Czech Republic. So these anxieties of national survival are very much linked to the question of migration. The other topic which uh, it's linked with, which uh, is of course not the subject of the book, but it's a project I'm working on, so this is aging, um, which also comes into that, of course, that uh, the, the arrival of young migrants um, is uh, accentuating the fears of extinction um, based in nationalist views, because of course, we have overall aging populations, because it is younger, uh, younger, uh, you know, uh, in, in a working age, 
citizens who leave and it's young working age people who arrive and those who are quote unquote left are in the ment at least in the imagination and um, the elderly and so this this kind of accentuates this uh, sense of anxiety and I think this is a source of great populist uh, and far right politics and I mean I think Orban's success is not least based on that. Um, and the last point um, I want to make is, um, which oh, the book raises, uh, interestingly, is, is, of course, how states treat different migrant communities differently. Um, so uh, it's the treatment of, you know, ethnic kin are given, a, you know, if they're perceived as ethnic kin are giving a, given a privileged position, while those who migrated in the European space are often seen as a threat because they are often uh, agents of not long distance nationalism as conventional literature would have it, but rather agents of, you know, you could call it Europeanization or often demanding more from the home societies in terms of um, rule of law, democracy, and so on. And I mean, I think Alexandra mentions it in the case of the Romanian uh, European diaspora, which has been very active in pushing for political changes through elections. And we've seen similar phenomena elsewhere in the region. Uh, and these are, in fact, the communities which are often excluded. So you can actually also see the same for Hungary, where it was a lot easier for a Hungarian uh, minority member from, Vo from Vojvodina or Transylvania to vote in national elections than for a Hungarian living in Vienna to vote in national elections, because, uh, of course, the state um, sees one as a, 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 a reservoir of votes and the other one as a threat. And so this is, I think, an interesting juxtaposition of national minorities versus migrant communities, uh, which are seen in the, especially the nationalist uh, imagination, uh, often as very different groups, which deserve very different treatment and very different ways of incorporating them into the political sphere. So in brief, um, there's a lot of interesting interesting discussions which I think can follow from, from this book. And I think these are just a few points which I've noted, which I found particularly relevant and salient. Hey, I think it's over to me. Can you hear me okay? Um, yeah, thank you. That was fascinating. Um, and I suppose I want to echo a lot of the points that have been made already. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this book launch. And thank you for um, one of the perks of this was we got a copy of the book. So I really enjoyed reading that and I found it really inspiring actually. Um, I just wanted, because it's such a dynamic region and I think the book captures that. I think of course there's that tension with trying to cover a lot, but you know, you sort of have to, you know, and I think you got a really good balance between, because you had your case studies and you had your framing. And I think it's just so refreshing to see that framing that's, e that's about Eastern Europe so unapologetically, you know, and embrace the messiness, embrace the complexity. You know, that's what I really loved about it. And a couple of things in particular, you don't shy away from the difficult discussions about what's happening in some of these countries, because there's this tension between being very critical of authoritarian or populist regimes. But, you know, certainly I'm very aware of my positionality here. You know, we can have this sort of Western centric discussion where we're continually pinning Eastern Europe as behind you know, when it's nonsense, look at how far right the UK government is now, you know, look at everything else that's happening in other parts of Europe. And I think you embrace that really well. I think it's, you, you don't shy away from some of those difficult discussions. And I think that's, that's really important. And I really love this sort of um, embracing that knowledge, the positionality, the situational knowledge. I think you're right, there's, there's, and there's more to do. Again, I'm very conscious of my positionality here as somebody who's British, who researches from a Sort of British perspective, really, migration or, or Western perspective. But yeah, there is there's a lot more work to be done to center that knowledge and you know make it sort of a more balanced playing field, I think. So I thought that was really refreshing. And so Roxandra urged to think not just about your book, but about things that the book has made you think about future questions or other big things that are going on. So from my reading of your book and the sort of work I've been doing, I've thought of five areas that I think um, merit further research from all of us that your book sort of wasn't able to touch on because it hadn't happened yet, or, um, you know, is sort of a foundation for it. So I think the first one is the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, I'm at the moment, I'm interviewing, I've been interviewing people who are hosting people from Ukraine. So it's very much at the forefront of my mind in terms of research, but also we can't get away from it, can we? I think reading your book made me realize how 
how seismic this could be for migration dynamics in Europe. For all the reasons you were saying, labour migration into Russia, um, all sorts of things are happening. Um, you know, a huge impact on migration, but also mobility in the region more generally, the ease of movement, border controls. Um, you know, I think the ramifications on this are going to be playing out for a long, long time. We don't know what role Russia will have in this region in terms of mobility and access and ease of passage, do we? So this is something to be looking at. Obviously, we've got this humanitarian crisis, um, you know, the displacement of so many people and the role of neighboring countries, other countries stepping up or, you know, to varying degrees to offer sanctuary uh, and all the political decision making and resourcing that goes with that, that's going to be a long time, you know, huge questions that are too early to think about really in terms of timing, you know, is this supposed to be temporary protection? And what does that mean for settling, you know, for hosting for all these sorts of things, we're still right at the beginning of these sort of experiences, I, I fear. And we can't get away from the other side of the racialization. I think this was touched on that, you know, when we're particularly from a UK perspective, we have so many discourses about refugees, but the Homes for Ukraine pro um, scheme has been quite publicly supported. You know, stark just juxtaposition to, you know, deportation to Rwanda sort of plans. So there's definitely a, we look at the racialization of people from Eastern Europe in different ways. You know, it's a sort of spectrum, I suppose, of racialization. I think there's also, um, Alexander, you said we need more research on Russia. We definitely need to remember people are fleeing Russia. And that's a whole new migration or a, a reinvigorated migration flow that we need to understand and you know be supportive of, I suppose. Um, and it just has important, you know, these are they're already diaspora communities that's sort of impacting. Uh, um, it's mobilized different diasporas, certainly from what I know the Polish populations and obviously the Ukrainian populations, you know, this is a huge event. You know, this is a huge development. The amount of effort and resources and emotional um, sort of buy-in from people, sending things, sending lorries, sending vans, sending people, you know, it's it's a huge sort of mobilization effort that I think we need to be aware of. It's changing the focus for diaspora, but also those those transnational family ties. You know, people, there were already quite a, quite a large um, Ukrainian population because of the visa waiver scheme in the EU. Um, so, you know, lots of people with, you know, families in Ukraine or it, it changes that dynamic again. So I think there are lots of things that we're going to see unfold in the next few years because of this. It reminds me of the work, I think she's Estonian, Maria Molksu. Um, she talks about um, her work, the memory politics of becoming European. Mm -hmm. And she talked about the asymmetry of memory and geopolitical understanding in relation to the Soviet threat in, in relation to the Second World War and how people in Eastern Europe weren't believed or they weren't taken seriously that this was a threat from Russia. You know, people who had that lived experience. And I wonder whether that somehow ties in now with these new understandings of migration and beyond that, you know, that this threat was real and that maybe in some of those EU level discussions that threat wasn't not the, the knowledge and lived experience of the region wasn't acknowledged and I wonder whether now we see this sort of intersection of migration coming into that as well through through the bodies of these people who are being displaced so that's one huge thing that I think we're all going to be thinking about um other things that stem from these other discussions exactly what you were saying Florian about um the mobility the ease of movement this is a new era low-cost airway all the rest of it the thing that I think stands out as well, though, is that a lot of this mobility is contingent. We can take it for granted. And, you know, we can get used to this idea that it's so easy to hop back and forth and we're so comfortable with this living in different spaces. You know, we've moved beyond these strict assimilation integration models now. But actually, what COVID has shown us in the UK, what Brexit has shown us, is that mobility always has a contingency and we don't know where the next mobility um, break might come from the politically or environmentally what environmental design you know features do we have um, with um, covid we saw more internal bordering we saw the suspension of schengen lots of new border checks um, you know we can talk about the impact of brexit for people from eastern europe 
um, you know, right through the whole spectrum of deportation to just feeling unsettled, you know, huge impact there on, on mobility and the fear of going back and forth. Of, and, and even the cost of going back and forth, that might change. Um, the fuel costs, um, you know, the, are, they, are those low cost carriers going to commit to these routes? Will that change with the, all this upheaval and this disruption? So um, lots of things there, even roaming charges on phones, you know, all these things, these connections have a framework around them. And I think we've seen that we can't take it for granted, um, you know, that these things could change over time. Thirdly, um, again, picking up on the hierarchies, how different people are treated differently. Um, so, as in the UK, Ukrainian refugees have been embraced perhaps in a way that other refugees have not been embraced as, as obviously, but there's still definitely this east-west junction that we, we can't shy away from. A lot of my research has been UK, but also Nordic um, context, and time and time again we've seen the racialization of Eastern Europe not being white, not being European, you know, played out in everyday encounters, played out in populist discourses. It's not going away. I think, you know, we want to move beyond, on the one hand, we want to move beyond post-socialist framing, you know, all the time. But on the other hand, there is still this, there's still this thing that's that, that pits East and West, I think, that, that's troubling and that we need to be aware of. And for me, in the work I've done, I've seen that it has real impact. You know, the, we see that EU citizenship, Florian mentioned this, is really conditional. And that has huge impacts on people's livelihoods, their lives, their psychological well-being. Um, in Norway, um, it's very easy to get Polish men, older Polish men, to do, you know, tough work on building sites and then not give them health care. You know, and that's perfectly legal. You know, there are these frameworks where there's this continual threat of exploitation. Not all people from Eastern, but there still is this sort of troubling asymmetry, I think. Um, in the UK, um, we've just seen the latest attack on people from Albania for some reason in the, in the media. You know, this doesn't go away. So I think we have to be attentive to that, you know, and, you know, there's still this sort of colonial discourses or whatever it is around it. And um, penultimately, this is a discussion about politics and media. And um, we've talked about economics in terms of migration forever. I think economics becomes more important again with the cost of living crisis, with um, the impact of the war. Um, I think what's interesting is we might be seeing economic shifts in the continent where those certainties are being eroded perhaps. And from a UK point of view, I can't see I mean, maybe this is naive, you know, in terms of other struggles, but the UK is not in a good place economically. Um, you know, we've got huge issues, just like a lot of countries have with inflation. Now, interviews of people from Poland, um, thinking about the psychological well-being that goes with economic security. Some of the things people were most fearful of with Brexit was price rises. You know, it wasn't actually being deported or settled status or the rest of it. It was, we've lived through hyperinflation in the 90s. You know, we've lived through that economic instability. We don't want that again. And, you know, what we're experiencing now might well fold into some of these return narratives. That might be the thing that pushes people. Or it might be, it might be that, you know, Europe, the East-West economic sort of framing of Europe is changing, you know, uh, which, which might have an impact impact again on those um those um sort of migration routes sarah marie hall in geography at manchester talks about um altered life courses and austerity we might see altered migration trajectories as the economic certainties you know seem to change i suppose and then finally um i think there's more historical work that could be done particularly thinking about the decolonial impetus embracing the diversity of the region i think there's a lot more political mileage and um, intellectual stimulation to come from thinking about um, thinking of how easy it is to pin a, a narrative of racial, racial hom homogeneity in the region and, and not unpacking that a bit more. Because it's, as we know, it's a hugely diverse region in terms of ethnicity, but there are those other histories. There are those, um, I don't know, different populations from the socialist labor exchanges, You've got this, you know, the longest um, Muslim population in Poland through the Tatar population. I don't know. I think there's more historical 
work to be done that embraces a different kind of diversity in the region, which might actually be doing something important. Um, I love the book by Dembski and, and Sionetska, Stage Otherness, um, Ethnic Shows in Central and Eastern Europe, which sort of, um, which sort of thinks in those decolonial ways about the colonial um, tropes that Eastern European countries were also following. And I think there's, on both sides, there's more to be done to think about um, this region's involvement in those dis colonial discourses, but also the diversity that was there, even if it's in small ways and thinking why that's important and why those histories need to be, need to be found and, and, and kept. But yeah, so that's, that was a sign of your book that it got me thinking and I really enjoyed that time reading it and thinking about these big questions because you don't get the chance to do that very often. You don't step back and think about this. So yeah, so thank you again for this and for the invite. Well, thanks everyone. Um, it's really fascinating to hear you guys talking about your own thoughts and reflections on the book and reflecting that back on your own research. Um, if people in the audience have got questions, please put them in the chat or else I'm going to take up the next 15 minutes asking all the questions that I've got. Um, but I'll start with two. Um, I think uh, one uh, to you, Roxandra, directly, but probably the three of you have thoughts on this. Um, from my own research as well, although not specifically on migration, you are right. The, the, uh, I think the discourse on countries in the global south often feels like it overwhelms that discourse and discussion about countries from Eastern Europe. And I wonder in what ways perhaps it's possible to challenge, to challenge that and to have those conversations. And secondly, and I think perhaps a, something which I was thinking about when you were talking is perhaps more prescient. I'm now working on um, ESRC Transatlantic Platform Project with um, academics across four countries, one of which are academics situated in Warsaw. And the number of Ukrainian migrants currently living in Warsaw almost equals the population of Polish people living in Warsaw. It's almost doubled the, the population of that one city. And while at the time people thought this was going to be something that might have gone on for weeks or months, it could actually go on for years. And so there are, I think, many new avenues to look at the impact of research um, in addition, perhaps the ones that you outlined, Cathy. And thirdly, I thought, Florian, uh, your point about when does uh, a population become a minority um, was really interesting. And I wondered um, whether the panel had thoughts on that and whether or not you can place a measure on this or whether this is something that really just generates um, organically. So I'll leave you to discuss those things and hopefully we'll have some more questions in the chat so it won't just be mine. Over to you guys. Um, thank you, Joe. Um, and yeah, thank you to Kathy and Florian for um, uh, reviewing the book so thoroughly and, and raising some quite important um, issues and additions um, to, um, to my work. Re regarding to, um, to the issue of um, decolonization, um, the problem that Eastern Europeans have is that the, the issue, they, they don't necessarily still see themselves as um, having been colonized. Um, and there is research emerging at the moment. Um, and there is a, let's say, um, increased understanding of processes of colonization um, that are historical. You know, Kathy is right, that they are historical. Um, you know, the Ottomans, the Habsburgs, um, the, um, the Soviets, you know, these are all processes of colonization. But the problem is that we don't have a language in which to talk about these experiences because the language of, of colonization is mainly associated with experiences of the global south and the traditional, um, you know, form of British, French and so on colonies. So I think, you know, Eastern Europeans have shied away from expressing, um, you know, the, 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 the experiences of, of colonization in those terms. And also, you know, 
feeling that maybe they are inadequate, the language that we have is inadequate. I'm not saying it's been hijacked. I think, you know, that that work is very valuable and necessary in relation to the global South. But the fact that, you know, there's always a differentiation, you know, we are told in Eastern Europe, well, at least you were white. And, um, um, you know, but as Kathy says, um, white but not quite white and in, indeed there's there's a new book out by a professor at Toronto University Ivan Kalmar um, that um, talks about uh, you know uh, the not quite whiteness um, of Western Europe so I think you know there's a problem of terminology and a problem of acknowledging um, past experiences. Any other views from the panel? Yeah, I mean, I think maybe I'll address the question uh, you, you raised about, you know, new minorities or when minorities become minorities and migration. And I mean, I think it works, of course, both ways. When, you know, there's a, you know, there, there, there is a long tradition of also migrants from Central and Eastern Europe to Western Europe, you know, to the rural area where there's been Polish migrants going back to the 19th century, for example. So these are not, you know, new patterns. They were disrupted uh, in many ways. Uh, and many of them have become assimilated rather than kept a sense of, of, of minority community. Um, and the very fact that Vietnamese can become a minority in the Czech Republic suggests an interesting pattern that we have communities which are clearly an origin outside of Europe um, and, you know, through migration have become uh, minorities. And I think to some degree, of course, this is always an organic process. Um, we have countries which have legal uh, tools to allow for recognition or non-recognition. I think in Hungary it says a hundred years uh, quite explicitly. In other countries you have, you know, traditionally settled minorities, and then you can, uh, you know, guess what traditional means uh, in that context. Um, and of course, many of the, uh, if we look at the, um, you know, the, the pattern of migration in Southern Europe, um, you know, we have many of the um, the first kind of generation migrants there have become very assimilated. I mean, thinking particularly of Albanians who've moved uh, after the fall of communism to Greece and to Italy, um, who are very substantial mi you know, migrant communities in both countries. Also, by the way, two countries which had, and this is kind of the duality, which had previously Albanian minorities. Um, and, you know, they don't always coexist at all or, or interesting relations emerge. I mean, the similar way in which you have um, you know, questions of should minorities which are recognized get a different treatment to migrants who come to the same place, right? So they thought about, you know, the, the, so, so you know, in, in Austria and the Burgenland area, there's a Croatian minority historically uh, recognized, but if a Croat comes there through labor migration, who, should she or he not get the same rights as a quote unquote recognized member of the minority? I mean, these are kind of interesting questions which come, which are not just legal questions, but also ones of, you know, um, you know, minority rights being offered only to certain groups, even if you have people who benefit from it in the same way, the same language and so on um, next door. So I think these are, you know, kind of questions which will come up, but probably the new migrants coming to Central and Eastern Europe at first, will probably be um, not large enough as communities and also uh, often in a very vulnerable position. Um, so I don't think that they are going to become the next recognized minority. I mean, they are the concern is more uh, not non-discrimination, non-exclusion uh, from the society. This is the, the threat. And I think what we're seeing actually now uh, is how in Central and Eastern Europe, um, new migrants are becoming increasingly targets of uh, hostility in a way. I mean, I see this in Southeastern Europe where in the, when we take the, the, the big uh, transit of migrants in 2015-16, there was a sense of, of, of we are more welcoming to migrants than people in Western Europe were. But this discourse was very much, you know, of course, based on the assumption that none of them would stay, um, that they would be, you know, that they would be in transit. Um, and now, tens of thousands have become stranded because of the repressive border policies of EU member states. Um, and we see a shift now. There are far right movements in places like Serbia uh, called, for example, there's one called the People's Patrol, and they've been going around uh, harassing taxi drivers who've been driving refugees or migrants uh, through the country. Um, they've been engaging, they've, you know, it was a rally, you know, call under the slogan of you will not replace us, you know, kind of 
paying, you know, kind of re reflecting the the, uh, the great replacement theory. Um, so you see these Western European discourses um, arriving in Southeastern Europe as well, um, directed against migrants. Um, and I think that that shows also how uh, there's a communication space in Europe of these ideas, um, anti anti migrant discourses as well, which are shared by countries which in the past have not really been concerned with migrant policies. And of course, the prime example was Poland, which uh, at the time when the Kaczynski led uh, peace led government. Uh, moved into the anti-immigrant discourse had no migrants of su substantial numbers or the only substantial migrants already back then were Ukrainians but the anti-migrant rhetoric was never directed against Ukrainians but was directed against uh, non-Europeans um, even though there weren't any so you can have of course anti-migrant discourse without actually any substantial number of migrants um, as, as we know from that experience. No, you said something about Russia, and I I can't remember exactly what you said. Could, did you? Did it need? Is there more to say for that? Hi, sorry, it wouldn't let me unmute then for some reason. Um, yeah, well, I was uh, a couple of things when you were talking. Um, one, uh, the project I'm doing at the moment. Um, in Warsaw, there now more Ukrainian people living there than than Polish because of the war, but also most of um most of the the soldiers that are fighting in ukraine right now are not actually from european russia a lot of them are from uh central uh and central republics and asian republics and some discussion as well now about what that might mean in terms of the makeup of the russian federation and and how and what happens when the war is over, because we none of us can see an exit strategy here that doesn't result in some kind of regime change in the Russian Federation and what that might mean. I think as well, something I didn't ask, but there is, of course, in the UK, a, a large discussion now about people seeking asylum from Albania, a discourse about whether or not it's possible to do that, given that Albania is on the so-called safe country list. So there's lots and lots of different things that we could pick up in this discussion. Um, but I think we only have a few minutes left, and I I feel that I have dominated asking asking the questions. Um, so I'm going to ask one more time. Anybody else has got a question they want to pose, uh, please do so. But maybe Kathy, you have some other reflections. No, it was just to reiterate. Just it's messy, isn't it? It's it's very hard to have a a clear sight like, in terms of movement of people. I mean, I suppose one of the things war does is it it moves people. So yeah, so. I suppose it, I hadn't really thought through the fact that it will be moving people through the armed forces as well as moving people through displacement. I'd just say one thing about to Florian is I don't think Ukrainians in Poland were universally, universally welcomed. I think that one of the things that's happened is, and this links to the question actually in the chat, is my understanding from colleagues I know who are working there at the moment is that some of the rhetoric might have changed a bit that the Ukrainians are suddenly more welcome now that, they, that they're that they in need and that there's this common threat that is understood. Whereas before they were a lower in the hierarchy as labor migrants filling in the gaps for people who'd left sort of thing. But yeah, so I think that that might be a dynamic that's changed as well. And yes, we have a question in the chat, which is about motivation and does motivation for migration actually matter? If you're coming as an economic migrant as opposed to fleeing persecution, does that matter? And does that distinction make it unhelpful when conversations of this nature and others are taking place? Uh, anyone from the panel have a view? Well, I mean, I think, I mean, Kathy already said that, that, I mean, I think it's true, of course, that that might make a difference in the case of how Ukrainians are perceived before 20th, uh, before March, uh, February of this year or, be, or, or afterwards in countries like Poland. But, you know, I think race is much more important um, in or, or in non-Europeanness in the perception of migrants. I mean, I think um, across most of continental Europe, there's such a distinction made between, uh, you know, uh, European, you know, Ukrainians have overall in numbers been welcomed, and there's no 
you know, panic, which we've seen in 2016 about, about Ukrainians in Europe. I mean, there isn't this, I mean, yes, in Hungary a little bit, but overall, you know, in Austria, there's no discussion about that there are, you know, tens of thousands, numbers very similar to the migrant numbers which came to Austria or Germany, um, you know, five years ago or six years ago. And back then this was, you know, uh, can we manage it? Will our society, you know, suffer irres irreversible damage? And there's none of these debates nowadays. Um, and, you know, and it's got a lot to do with race or with, you know, the perception that European migrants are, are, are okay. And, you know, even though, I mean, of course, and then the motivations are questioned, right? This is then the second step. So then you say, well, you know, are these really Syrians and are they really fleeing war or are they not just seeking economic opportunities? Um, and, and, you know, of course, we know there were migrants who came for economic opportunities, but it's kind of assumed that if somebody comes from Africa to Europe, that they are first of all economic migrants, even if they're fleeing from a you know from a war torn society or country. So, so I think I think you know that that often gives the legitimacy to 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 question because the argument is if you're there for economic reasons, you are illegitimate. Um, and and uh, you can dismiss them because very few people would say in mainstream society we don't want them because they're Africans or because they're non-Europeans. But uh, but uh, the, the the causes provide the justification for for the kind of racialized framework um, of of these of these uh, perceptions. Well, guys, I think uh, we are on the hour. And uh, as I don't think we have any other questions, I think what I will do is I will thank you very much for, the, for joining us today. I strongly encourage those of you who've not acquired a copy of Roxandra's book to do so and to read it. And um, Roxandra will be following this up with a blog post on the ISR blog, which I'm sure she will then um, retweet through her network. So also look, at that, look out for that. So thank you very much for attending today. Great seminar, loads to think about. And we look out for the work from all of the panelists in the future. Thank you very much, everybody.